I'm Ian Kavat. Hello and welcome to Taiwan Talks, coming to you from National Zhengzhou University here in Taipei. Taiwan is entering a new era. On May 20th, the country ushers in a new president, Lai Qingde, who replaces Tsai Ing-wen. He does it at a time of rising global and regional tensions. So how will Lai Qingde uh, guide the country through an increasingly fraught environment? For the first time, Taiwan Talks is joined by an audience who will help us pose questions to our panel. Let me welcome the four professors from NCCU today. We have Charles Wu, Department of Diplomacy Professor and Chair, Huang Guibo, Director of the Center for Global and Regional Risk Assessment, Sun Bingkui, Department of Diplomacy Professor, and Li Jiayi, the Director of the International Master's Program in International Studies. Very warm welcome to all on the show today. Let's go straight to our first question from the audience. If you can say your name and your question. Host, host professors, my name is Skyler Lee from the Department of Diplomacy. My first question is, how do you believe China would react to President Nye's inauguration? And what do you believe would be China's approach on cross-strait policy across President Nye's four-year term? Thank you. Okay, Professor Wu, if I can come to you um, first, just for a bit of context, we've been hearing a lot of speculation about what China might do around the inauguration after basically increasing pressure on Taiwan since the January election. So what do you believe China will do? Um, uh, let, we observe since Lai Qingde as the president of the DPP, um, people still doubt whether he will you know, move to a de jure independence in the future. So I don't expect there's any kind of, you know, fireworks or like warm welcome standing by Beijing. However, we can see that they still want a stabilized close relations, especially both Beijing and Washington, they want a more stabilized uh, close relations before, I think, before any time the U.S. elections. So like I say, uh, people are now talking about uh, the resumption of the tourist groups and also remove the restrictions from the mainland China tourists. I think there will be a major issue uh, right after the uh, May 20th uh, Lai Qingde inaugurations. However, this we can see as a game of tit for tat, whether uh, uh, Beijing will move first or Taipei will move first to forward their kind, we call the friendly uh, kind of signals to each other. So, so you're saying it's a test? So I think there's more test coming. Uh, the test will be from more economic perspective then moving to a more political, deep water perspective. And eventually, I think uh, Beijing will also put the 92 consensus to the midterm test for uh, lighting the administration. Professor Huang, so um, if we can classify, you know, the relaxing of Chinese tourists to Matsu uh, as perhaps carrots, you know, we know that there have been the sticks, um, essentially the increased incursions into uh, Taiwan's ADIZ as well as crossing the median line. What do you think about this carrot and stick uh, approach? Do you think actually what Beijing's doing for the inauguration has actually already started? And it's been clear that the Beijing authorities has been adopting a so-called two-tier policy. Uh, the first tier is toward the government or those organizations in favor of Taiwan independence. So Beijing is giving some harsh measures to those organizations, including the DPP government, in order to uh, pressurize this wave of Taiwan independence. And another tier is for the general public that are not for independence. So Beijing is giving more uh, goodwill measures, or some people say united front measures, to this general public in order to woo the support or woo the uh, 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 better feeling about the Beijing authorities in terms of cross-strait relations. And I would like to say that, you know, Lai Qingde is not going to enjoy some period of the so-called uh, listen to the words and watch the deeds period, like what Chen shui enjoyed before. That is, there, was, there will be no honeymoon period between the Lai government and the Beijing authorities. So I think the tense between Taipei and Beijing will continue uh, roughly on May 20th and afterwards. So, Professor Tan, what does Beijing want Lai to do? 
So I, I think, of course, as we can see that Beijing has some preference over the 90, 92 consensus. And we all know that Lai and DPP will not uh, follow up. So uh, it is a conflict that necessarily will happen after Let's the Let's define what the 1992 consensus is. So, so uh, there was a tacit consensus between the two parties in, in 1992 that um, we can set off, uh, set the political issues, political disputes aside and talk about other issues first. And by not talking about political issues, it kind of is respect each other's uh, claims on the sovereignty on uh, in on the on the political situation in in Taiwan Strait. So uh, this is something that uh, Tsai Ing-wen rejected, and you can expect that a lie will not accept it as well. Um, so uh, this, of course, will not satisfy Beijing, and uh, as we as we can see that Beijing will try to push. Uh, the DPP government to uh, to accept some kind of some versions of uh, 92 consensus, but uh, it is not likely to happen. So uh, we we can ex anticipate that during the last four years there will be uh, sanctions, there will be uh, conflicts, and I, I I do think that economic sanctions are more likely, and those are targeted economic sanctions. Mm. Professor Lee, if I can bring you in. Um, so the 1992 consensus as uh, defined by Professor Chen, can I ask you, does the CCP recognize that the ROC exists? Does the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, does it actually recognize that the, C that the, that the ROC, the Republic of China, exists? Or that, does it think that Taiwan is a part uh, of China? Of course, we know the CCP has always claimed that Taiwan is part of the Chinese territory. So I don't think uh, China is going to recognize whoever the president is in Taiwan. China is not going to recognize the existence of ROC. Mm. Yeah, I, I think if I can go back to, to Professor Wu. So, so that is the problem. Just to uh, give the side of the DPP is they see it as a rhetorical trap. The 1992 consensus It essentially to them, they say it means that Taiwan says it's a part of China because the CCP does not recognize the ROC. Uh, the, the CCP sees Taiwan as a province um, of China. So that, that is their, their perspective. Uh, so 2027 is not very far off. And this is a year that Xi Jinping has asked the PLA to be ready to have the capability to invade Taiwan. Do you think that Taiwan is entering one of the riskiest periods, eras in its history? Um, actually, I don't think so. Uh, first question is when we study conflicts or study war, especially using the regional decision-making model, as I told you, uh, you need to look at opportunity and willingness. And you need both conditions. And they are both necessary conditions, which means you have opportunity to fight and you also have willingness to fight. Right now, everybody say China or PLA will be capable to initiate attack on Taiwan in 2027. It represents opportunity. However, we also need to look at the willingness. What kind of willingness Xi Jinping will use or he will start to attack Taiwan? I think it's the most important thing we need to consider. So right now, people say, if we study Chinese politics, what kind of red lines, if you break it, they will use force to Taiwan. This is independence. So people say, once there's issue or opportunity, to have independence, there will be a, you know, the final straw on the camels to push Xi Jinping to use force. So likewise I say, 2027, which means POA probably ready, but it doesn't mean they are willing to use force. This mm. is my answer. Okay. Um, so Professor Huang, we know that Xi Jinping has repeated over and over again that he will not leave Taiwan re reunification, so-called reunification, to future generations. He wants to deal with it during his, his leadership. So when we talk about 2027, that is one date, but uh, we can also talk maybe 2035. Do you think that uh, we would get to the stage where Xi Jinping, because he said that he would take Taiwan any which way, either peacefully um, or by force. Uh, do you think that over the next 10, 20 years, Taiwan enters an incredibly risky time. 
You know, first of all, I actually have no clue whether or not Xi Jinping has given such a specific order to the PLA about taking Taiwan over 2027. I have no clue. And if someone knows, then I think he or she is so almighty that, you know, we, know, we don't know something he or she knows. And second, I think as, as you asked, I think, you know, Taiwan has been in some risky situation because nowadays we have seen more and more PLA or the Coast Guard vessels or airplanes incursion of those areas where they didn't come before. And also uh, the difference between the military powers between Taipei and Beijing is large and uh, large. So I think for Taiwan, the most important thing is to enhance self-defense capabilities, or some people said deterrence capabilities. However, I would also stress that Taiwan should not ignore the importance of political communication, because you need two legs, you know, deterrence and communication in order to deal with the Beijing authorities pressure or further desire for so-called national unification. Is that responsibility also shared with the CCP though? The responsibility. For dialogue in, and yes, for improving relations. Yes, that's, that's why the both sides need to find some common political dialogue, a uh, foundation for dialogue. Like in the past, as we just talked about the 1992 consensus, that's one of the formulas that the both sides could sit down and talk. So of course, you know, Beijing and Taipei needs to use their wisdom to find out a way in order to you know, have some further or ensuing communication. We, uh, unlike what we are seeing today, it's riskier and riskier. Okay, let's go to the, uh, the next question from the audience. Uh, my name is Tina Yuan. So my question is, what is the priority status for Lai Qing following his inauguration, enhancing cross-strait relations or securing formal diplomatic ties? Thank you. Okay, so I just want to clarify that that question um, is actually a choice between improving relations with China and establishing uh, formal diplomatic allies. It does not include uh, it does not include informal uh, allies in terms of Western liberal democracies. Is that right? Um, yes. Yes. Okay. So I'll address that question to Professor Chen. Okay. Uh, first of all, I think uh, there's no reason that why Lai Qingde cannot do both. Uh, Lai can try to improve and have, have a dialogue with Beijing at the same time, exploring new opportunity to create and build diplomatic relations and also informal diplomatic relations too. Um, so we know that Taiwan has strengthened uh, its relations with a lot of different countries who do, who do not have uh, diplomatic ties. So I don't see why Lai Xingde would not do both. Uh, maybe he intends to do both, but the problem is whether he can achieve the goal, right? Uh, because in both, uh, in, in both things you just mentioned, uh, Lai Xingde enc encountered a lot of barriers. Uh, on the other hand, uh, because we people who study international relations tend to look at diplomatic relations at, at, at a first, at the, as a first priority. Uh, think about uh, as, a, as Lai Xingde, as a president-elect, your priority might be domestic politics. Your priority might be economics, might be uh, the uh, domestic political situation, your party's unity. So in Foreign affairs might not be on the top list of Lai Qingde. Okay, Professor uh, Li, would you like to offer your, your analysis, this choice between China or formal di diplomatic allies? Okay, actually when I first heard the question, my answer is that neither is the most important priority for Lai Qingde. I think he will definitely maintain a closer tie with the United States because no matter for what, what reason, the United States is going to be very important to tai, Taiwan. So I think, but if we want to exclude, as you mentioned, if we want to exclude the relationship with Western countries, um, choosing between uh, cross-strait relations and securing formal diplomatic ties, I think the latter will be more important, probably more important to Lai Qingde because naturally Lai Qingde has some constraints in, in terms of um, cross-strait relations. We know that Lai Qingde once said that he 
is a pragmatic worker for Taiwan independence, right? So we know that he has some ideology. He has some vision for the cross-strait relations. So I think in terms of this, he's kind of, um, it, it will be very difficult for him to improve uh, largely with uh, the re relationship with China. So I, my, my observation or my expectation is that Lai Xinde will basically continue Tsai Ing-wen's uh, foreign policy, especially uh, mainland uh, policy. So I don't think, um, I think the second one is probably more important. To and, and what do you think he should do? I think, of course, he should secure the current um, countries that we have diplomatic ties with. But of course, I think Taiwan needs to strengthen other relationship with other countries. For example, we can use our soft power, we can use our influence in the uh, global supply chain, semiconducting supply chain. I think we have the economic capability. We also have other capability to um, increase our image or reputation in the international society. So I think Lai still has um, some mechanisms, some ways he can do t to improve Taiwan's international status. Mm. Okay. And um, Professor Wu, let me come to you too. What do you believe uh, the Lai administration should focus on um, over the next four years? Um, I mean, I agree with uh, Jia Yi's. Uh, uh, Lai Xing does uh, foreign affairs and also cross relations will mostly follow the Tsai Ing-wen administration. We, from the cabinet members he uses uh, and also his strategy he uses, uh, I think uh, he will pay more attention to the diplomatic relations with our current allies, this for sure. Uh, also try to secure our diplomatic allies. Try to probably break through the China's contents, probably in the South Pacific, probably we can get one or two new members, we don't know, but I heard it's probably a possibility. Professor Huang, um, the US has communicated, say that deterrence didn't work and uh, you know, China is preparing uh, to attack Taiwan. So the US has communicated that if Taiwan does not try to defend itself, then they uh, probably will not come to the aid of Taiwan. They use the example of Ukraine a lot, that the Ukrainians had to show their willingness. Why do you think that there is concern from the Americans about Taiwanese resolve to defend the country? No, it has been so. I mean, the American attitude toward Taiwan for many decades. Uh, I, I think uh, that results from the following two or three factors. The first is that I, I believe each American administration would feel insecure or worried about the loss of American weaponry systems to the Beijing authorities if there is a war between the two sides and Taiwan does not have the strong will to defend. And the second factor could be that, you know, the U.S. You know, cannot use its troops in Japan and South Korea to come to Taiwan to give help. Therefore, U.S. needs probably 10 to 14 days at least to, must, uh, to, to muster its armies and send it to this Taiwan Strait. So in these 10 to 14 days, if Taiwan does not have the strong will to defend itself, then why bother U.S. sending troops to Taiwan to see such a you know, Taiwan of, surrender, uh, of a surrendered peace to mainland China? Uh, so at least these two factors you know, explain partially why the U.S. always asks Taiwan to show its strong determination for its self-defense. Okay, so uh, now I just want, want to hear from uh, the audience. So I want to pose the same question that I asked uh, Professor, Professor Huang. Uh, why do you think it is that people doubt, or the, the US, Americans doubt Taiwanese resolve to defend the country? Anybody want to, to offer any thoughts? Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Mark. I'm an American who's a master's uh, diplomacy student. Uh, I think in terms of the way that Americans usually think about Taiwan, first, if they know about Taiwan, I think they are aware that some Taiwanese are very much for independence and others are very much for the status quo along with China. And I think that that uh, disconnect between who is really for independence and who is really siding with China is really confusing because it really makes it their commitment to fighting for that kind of independence very muddy. So I think that's why a lot of Americans are hesitant towards where China stands in this matter. Yeah, I think that's a, 
a valid point. Any other view? No? Okay, then I'll, I'll put a question to Professor Chen. So, um, the point that was just made there, um, that, that Taiwan is divided between uh, people perhaps who are more pro-China, want to get closer, and then people who, you know, want to have this Taiwanese separateness, you know, independence um, side of things. Uh, we had a, a KMT uh, legislator visit to China recently, and on the return, uh, one of those members said, we don't want our sons to die for the DPP. So this sort of rhetoric would seem to say uh, that there are people like him who believe that defending Taiwan is about defending the DPP. How do you, how do you read that comment? And does that mean that, uh, you know, it's very clear that there are people who definitely would not defend Taiwan? I think this is why Americans and other uh, people, people in other countries usually confused, feel confused about the situation in Taiwan, whether people want independence or want status quo. Do people want status quo means that they don't want to defend Taiwan by themselves? Uh, the problem is, uh, what, what is special about the situation in Taiwan is that Taiwan has agency in the cross-strait relations. Taiwan can provoke a conflict. So if it is Taiwan authority who provokes the conflict, there is a strong internal split within the Taiwanese society. But, but this comes back to um, Professor Chen. Right. What I said that Xi Jinping has repeated over and over again, his intention is to take Taiwan. Right, if, but, if but, Xi Jinping is, wants to take Taiwan, you can expect most Taiwanese will resist uh, but if you were to you're talking about some people who wants to surrender to the enemy, there is a very important determinist, uh, determination uh, factor. That is whether Taiwan can stand by itself. Um, so I always say that uh, whether Taiwan, the Taiwanese, Taiwanese will, are willing to fight depend heavily on the U.S. commitment to Taiwan. If the U.S. commitment on Taiwan is shallow or weak, you can expect people in Taiwan to be weakened, right? And even people who want to stand up and fight, they will feel like they, their, their winning chance is really low. Unlike Ukraine, which, which we don't have the resources in the kind of territory that Ukraine has. So it is easy for people in Taiwan to be more pessimistic about this. Hmm. Okay. So you think fear that, 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 that American help might not come after 10 days would deter people from, from fighting? Or if the U.S. specifically says they won't come after 10 days. But if the U.S. says we will come to your aid if you can stand for 10 days, it will boost Taiwanese morale uh, significantly. So you're arguing for um, strategic clarity? No, not necessarily. Strategic clarity or strategic ambiguity only works when there is a uh, when there is an ample peace between the Beijing, Washington, and Taipei. Um, when we when it comes to conflict or or blockade, which is the most likely scenario that people talks about, um, it is it is a time to decide whether you want to intervene or not. So it's the the strat the strategic part is missing there. So you don't need strategic ambiguity or clarity. You have, to, you, ha you have to decide whether you want to intervene or not. So strategic ambiguity or clarity is no, no longer matter in that scenario. Hmm. P Professor Li, can I get your thoughts um, on, on this issue of, of Taiwan? In essentially, what we're saying now is that there seems to be that we need both uh, parts in place. We need the Americans to to confirm or to be to be clear that they will defend, and but the Americans also need the Taiwanese to send them a clear signal that they will stand up and defend their their right. country. Right. I think from Taiwanese perspective, we've given the gap between the military capabilities between China and Taiwan. Taiwanese tend to think we need the help from the United States. So actually, recently I have seen some survey data from among Taiwanese people. Indeed, the public opinion is quite divided in terms of whether they want to defend Taiwan in an event of cross-strait war. But if we add a condition that if the US 
is going to send military troops to help Taiwan in such an event. Actually, this will increase Taiwanese willingness to fight for Taiwan. So indeed, I think the U.S. assistance will be very important to um, the Taiwanese perception. But on the other hand, I think the United States is also worried about entrapment because um, we can say like the relationship between the United States and Taiwan is like a uh, patron and client relationship uh, in the international relations theory. So the patron state like the United States may provide protection to Taiwan in, such a, uh, in the event of if Taiwan is being attacked by China. But say if Taiwan does not show a strong commitment in terms of uh, defending ourselves, the United States will also worry about being dragged into a war which is so costly to them. So like the Vietnam War in 1970s. So the United States also want to avoid such a situation. So I have talked to some Americans from the military. They always act like how much you are committed to defending yourself. So I think from the American's perspective, it's also important for us to strengthen our self-defense, to strengthen our national uh, military capability. So these are, it's like a mutual situation. Mm. Okay, well that brings us to the end of the, two, of, of the first part of our show at National Zhengzhou uh, University. I want to uh, thank my guests, Charles Wu, Huang Guibo, uh, Zhang Bingwei and Li Jiayi, um, and also our audience for your participation too. If you liked our show, please search for us on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and hit subscribe to our channel. Thank you for watching Taiwan Talks today.